So yeah, my name is Evan Upson. I run a thing based in Cambridge called the Raspberry Pi, or called Raspberry Pi. Uh, we make these. Does anyone in the room own one of these? I thought, oh, it's really nice. It's lovely to come to these and see that. <laughs> um, so when I was a kid, I had a, I had a computer called a BBC Micro. I bought a BBC Micro computer when I was 10 years old. Uh, I'm not that old, so it was a very, very second-hand BBC Micro when I got it. Um, and the wonderful thing about my BBC Micro was that I would sit down in my bedroom every evening and I'd turn it on, and regardless of what I wanted to do with it, if I wanted to play games on it or if I wanted to uh, do my schoolwork on it, the very first thing that it did was it presented me with a black screen with white text on it and a flashing cursor. And if I wanted to do anything other than program with it, I had to choose not to program. Um, the um, a whole group of people my age, pretty much everyone my age, who had any um, facility for programming, any interest in programming, um, used these machines in our bedrooms to, um, to develop those skills. Um, and then over the 10 years from the mid-1980s when I was learning to the mid-1990s, something went away. Those machines were replaced by fixed function machines. They were replaced by games consoles. They were replaced by set-top boxes. Latterly, they've been replaced by tablets and mobile phones. And all of these are fantastic computing devices. These are 100 times as powerful as the machine that I had in the 1980s. Um, but they don't lure you into programming in the same way. Um, what this meant for us at Cambridge, so I spend a lot of time at the University of Cambridge, what this has meant for us at the University of Cambridge is a, a wonderful supply of 18-year-old children who would turn up at the university with their Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours of programming experience evaporated at some point between, 2000, between 1995 and 2005. Our numbers halved. The sorts, of things that, um, the sorts of things that people knew how to do when they came to the door changed from knowing three different sorts of assembly language, having been doing graphics hacking for 10 years. It changed from that to a group of people who maybe had done a web page. Maybe, they, maybe they'd written a web page. If we were really lucky, they'd done some web programming. If we were really lucky, they'd done a little bit of PHP. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. These are still bright kids coming in the door. But what it did mean is that at the university, we had to take, you know, take on our own shoulders in you know, Cambridge House. We have 20 weeks of contact time in a year. Over three years, we have 60 weeks to turn you from a sixth former into somebody um, who can start a UK three-year PhD program. Um, we were having to use a lot of the first 20 weeks, a lot of our first year, bringing people up to a level of knowledge that, um, that we'd previously been able to rely upon. Um, so, so 2005, a group of us at the university started looking around, wondering, wondering what had happened. We came up with the idea that the disappearance of these programmable computers from the 1980s had been directly responsible for this decline in numbers and this, dis and this, decline, in, um, uh, this decline in skills. And so we started to ask ourselves, well, can we build anything to... Uh, can we, build, can we do anything about this? Is, there, uh, is it that children are no longer interested? Is it that these enormously um, user-friendly, uh, non-programmable piece of hardware have beguiled children to such an extent that they're not interested in programming anymore? Or is there a niche that we could fill? And so we sat down and we decided we wanted to maybe try and build a piece of hardware. A lot of people have tried to solve these problems. And they've tried to solve the problems using courseware. They've tried to solve the problems using software. But we were wondering, you know, could we actually build a physical object that could try and solve this problem? We wanted a, an object that could do four things. We wanted an object which was programmable, obviously. We wanted to have an object which was interesting to children. Those computers in the 1980s were not bought, that uh, gave us a generation of programmers, two generations of programmers, were not bought necessarily to learn to program. They were bought to, people bought their spectrums to play games on, people were bought their BBC micros to do their schoolwork on. Um, they were only sort of the beguiling people into programming, it was only really a secondary effect. So we wanted something which was programmable, something which was interesting to children. We wanted something which was very robust. This was supposed to belong to the child. We think that there's a really nice analogy between the way that we teach um, children music and the way that we can teach them programming. That you give them a musical instrument, you give them a small amount of formal tuition in a, in a structured classroom environment, and then they have to be able to take this instrument home and spend hours and hours and hours in their bedroom practicing. So we wanted something that could survive being pushed into a school bag and taken out a hundred times, a thousand times. Um, and finally, we wanted something cheap because we were aware we were going to ask people, you know, who don't necessarily have a lot of money, to uh, to buy a new a new object in order to uh, uh, in order to do in order to learn to program on. And we settled on twenty five dollars. And we, the reason we settled on twenty five dollars was that's what we thought a textbook cost. Now that turned out not necessarily to be the best calculation. I think if we'd had a better idea of what textbooks cost, we then would have had a much easier job doing the engineering because we would have had a lot more fat that we could explain that into. But what we came what, so this started off in two thousand six, and what we ended up with in two thousand by the, the early part of last year, 2012, was this. This is a Raspberry Pi. 
Um, this is actually the deluxe Raspberry Pi. This is 35 US dollars, but we do do a 25 US dollar one. Um, and we put it on the market. We, went in, we, we put it on the market in um, uh, February of last year. Um, we are, so we're 20 months in. Um, we've sold uh, roughly 2 million of them. We build them in the UK, we build them in Wales. Um, and many, many, many of those 2 million have actually gone to adults. That's, I think, what we didn't realize is that there's an enormous uh, community of frustrated adult hackers out there who really, really want a piece of hardware that they can use to recreate some of that experience from their childhood. Um, but we are increasingly seeing in the hands of kids. We think we have up to half a million Raspberry Pis now in the hands of children. They've got into the hands of children, either children buying them themselves, parents buying them, schools buying them, voluntary organizations buying them. Um, we really are seeing from the submissions we get onto our website, we really are seeing some evidence that people are starting to use this to learn. Um, so just the existence of this, I think, is helping um, recreate in the UK and elsewhere in the developed world some of that culture of home hacking <coughs> among children, which was so important in generating the last generation of engineers and computer scientists. Um, one of the wonderful things, though, is every time we sell one of these, we make some money. Uh, we actually, this is a profit, both of the devices, the $25 and the $35 device are profitable. And this allows us to go and, I think, reach beyond the original conception of what Raspberry Pi was going to try and do. And one of the things we've been doing is a MOOC. Um, so, um, Sherry uh, is on the board of everything. What, wh which, which relevant organizations are you on the board of? You're on the board of Raspberry Pi Trading, you're on the board of CUP, CUP. and Cambridge, Cambridge Assessment. Assessment. Yeah. So, um, so, Sherry's on the board of all of the relevant organizations. Um, and what we've done, those, those organizations, Cambridge University Press, um, Cambridge Assessment, and Raspberry Pi, have got together to produce a piece of courseware, a uh, 120 installment um, MOOC, targeted at, um, well, nominally targeted at high school students. It supports the um, uh, Cambridge Assessment's uh, very well regarded GCSE uh, in computing. Um, but what we're actually finding it's used, being used by, it's being used by students. Uh, we have a lot of students in this country who want to study computing and are not lucky enough to be at schools which have um, high quality um, teaching staff who are trained in computer science as distinct from ICT. So it is being used by those students. Um, but we're also finding it being used by teachers a lot. I think we're seeing a lot of evidence that um, as we go through this curriculum change, we're going through a big curriculum change in the UK to add a level of rigor which has previously been missing from our computing education. Uh, and as we go through this, there's an enormous teacher training challenge. One of the really, really heartening things I think we've seen over the last, since we launched it in September? October? Yeah, September 29th. Yeah, there you are, technically September. Um, since we launched in September, is the proportion of the users of that MOOC uh, who are teachers. The proportion of the users of the MOOC who are teachers who are using it as a way to upskill themselves ahead of the 2014 introduction of the new curriculum. So we're having a blast. I mean, we've been having a blast with this, and now we're having a blast with the MOOC. Um, I'm going to devote the rest of my time to panel discussion, so I'm going to sidle off this way and try not to pull that hole. <laughs>